Today, it's a slow-moving bulldozer wreck. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance and Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and properties with a distinctively Australian flavour. Friday afternoon, Tarek Brooker is with me once again. Hi, Tarek. G'day, Martin. How are you, mate? Yeah, pretty good. Now, the big question is, how many charts did you get on one slide? Four, six, eight? <laughs> <laughs> no, I decided to just keep it to a, to a maximum of two because we've already got more than enough inflation in this world. <laughs> yeah, you posted something earlier on on Twitter, which is hilarious with all of those uh, charts around the place. I'm thinking, yeah, that is a problem. Chart inflation. <laughs> oh, it is. I, I, I've done and redone this over the over. The, I, start, I think I started on about Tuesday, and then you know, new new data comes out. We get we get additional charts, and then it just all. Well, it all just blows up into something much, much larger than it, than it was originally intended. But I think it'll be a good show for our, for our viewers. Well, blowing it up and not what perhaps what we originally intended sounds a bit like what the Fed has done and what the central banks have done with quantitative easing. And now they're trying to put the genie back in the bottle. And the question is, how far will they go before the Fed put puts the Fed put back on the Fed put stable? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's going to be an interesting one to see because Jerome Powell, during his recent reconfirmation as as Fed chair to 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 US uh, to the US um, Congress Senate, I should say, uh, was was quite hawkish. Was was very much we need to get inflation under control. We need to get inflation under control. And I think that Powell is really starting to realise that if he doesn't at least try to go very hawkish and at least try to to put downward pressure on inflation, you're going to start to see policies from, from political from political leaders start to try and do it for them. Like, for example, uh, there's, a, there's a, uh, a policy currently before the US Congress to put price controls on, on gasoline and diesel. And, you know, I mean, you can imagine what, what that would do in terms of, you know, basically returning us to the early to mid-1970s. Mm, well, I thought it was very interesting that Biden actually came out and referred to high inflation being his critical domestic policy issue before the CPI number came out. So he knew which way the bread was going to fall on the floor. No, he, he, he would have, exactly. And I, I think that I think that, that that CPI number would have would have concerned them quite a lot because while it's all well and good to say, oh, inflation's peaked, inflation's peaked, and well, one, we don't know whether that's the case or not. It could still go, it could still go higher next month or in the future. We just we don't we don't know. But it's also the fact that, to be completely frank, I don't think peak inflation really matters all that much to the to the US economy and to the broader outlook, because as long as inflation is still well and truly above the Fed's 2% target rate, they're going to be forced to be hawkish, whether it's whether it's political pressure or pressure from the bond market. Yeah, so the point, of course, is that the 2% is so far away from the 8%. You know, it doesn't matter whether it's 8% or 8.5%. It's still way above. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't really matter even even if inflation comes down, you know, two, three, four percent. I mean, you're still going to be looking at well above four percent inflation, which is still a nightmare scenario for them. And I mean, it, one of, uh, a Harvard economics professor came out on Twitter the other day and said a recession may only decrease inflationary pressures by about one percentage point of the CPI. So it's it's really really quite challenging for them because I mean, it's entirely possible that based on their mandate, that they could be forced to hike well into a recession, particularly if, it, if, if employment holds up relatively well. Yeah, and of course, the point there is that the drivers of inflation, or some of its supply chain, some of it's to do with the oil, but a lot of it actually is now embedded in domestic uh, momentum in the US itself. So wages is already quite strong in some areas, and uh, therefore it's going to get very hard to control. Um, so I think you're right, they're going to have to put rates up and them a long way. The question is, how long and how far will they go before they have to reverse course? Well, it really just depends on when when they break something. You know, they're going to. That's what the Fed generally does. They hike and hike and hike until they break something sufficient that it creates a, enough downward pressure on inflation to basically, you know, drive, drive another the start of another business cycle. Then they cut rates. Then they do QE, and then they just start the whole thing all over again. But what if, I mean, the, the real big question is, is what if this time is different? What if they can't do that? What if they're forced to continue to be hawkish or at the very least neutral in terms of and, and not being able to cut rates and not being able to engage in QA 
then that's a whole nother ball game that we, we've never really had to confront. Yeah, and it goes back to what I said, you know, what it, where is the Fed put and is it really going to come back? And if it doesn't, um, it could be quite interesting. And, of course, the F financial stability report from the Fed last week called on about um, stability concerns relating to the lack of liquidity in the markets, which I thought was a really interesting comment. And not many people picked that up, but for me that was very relevant. Well, it is. I think it's interesting that, like, if you look at, say, liquidity within within the U.S. stock market, it's it's plumbing lows, not re, not really seen since, well, well, since the, the the COVID crash, since you know March, April, May last year, and you know that that thin liquidity is leading to these these further bouts of volatility, both in terms of downward momentum and also these what are now really bear market rallies with you know the Nasdaq now down more than it was during the during the COVID crash and only exceeded in the last you know what 20 years now by the the crash of the financial crisis yeah and apple's now in bear territory so that's quite an interesting observation it looks to me as though some of those uh more sporty high-tech stocks are the ones that have actually fallen further so that tells you something quite important too i think it does and i think that one of the interesting things is that you know some analysts are starting to point to you know these this compression you know this lowering of price to earnings ratios as something bullish but I, I i don't think that it is personally now this is not financial advice so yada yada blah blah you know all all that all that those the usual disclaimers but the thing is we haven't seen earnings drop in a material way yet that is what potentially lays ahead. You've got inflation dragging on earnings. You've got supply chain issues dragging on earnings. And all of those things still still very much lay ahead. And we're starting to see those earnings downgrades come in. And, you know, it's it, it all that lays ahead. Yeah, and just remember that the Fed has just moved 50 basis points so far, right? <laughs> so it's not like they've started in earnest yet and they haven't really done their quantitative easing tightening yet. So there's a lot more to come. No, 50 basis points in the latest minutes, or is it 75 in total now? Yeah. 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 No, it's it's gonna be it's it's gonna be an interesting one to watch because you know they're still we're still talking about you know a three percent federal federal funds rate around that by the end of the year. And if, if that were if that were to happen, it's well let, let let's just be honest, it's it's probably it's it's probably fairly likely that something will break before then because we're still on what, another seven and a half months. <laughs> Exactly right. Well, we get into your charts because you spend a lot of time putting them together. So um, why don't we uh, plow in? Yep, sure. Well, as usual, folks, the the charts are available at avidcom.substack.com. And I'd like to say a big thank you to everyone who's uh, supported me and everyone who's subscribed. And just we'll get we'll get on with it. Okay, uh, I thought I thought it'd be interesting to start with the first. Anglosphere nation to raise interest rates, which was New Zealand, and housing prices are getting are getting absolutely smashed in some in some cities in in Auckland and Wellington. They're both they're both down more than ten percent since their peaks, their respective peaks in October and November last year. And nationally, excluding Auckland, they're still down three and a half percent. And these price falls are they, they are accelerating, with prices outside of Auckland down one point four percent in the month of April alone. Mm. Yeah, uh, I think it's a very significant um, um, storyline here because, of course, New Zealand lifted rates early. So they started last October, 1.5% higher now. They also brought in some credit controls to try and actually uh, reduce investment lending. And uh, the net effect is uh, a significant drop. But interestingly, of course, they also announced this week that they're going to open the migration doors specifically to uh, qualified migrants who can become residents almost immediately. So here we are. You start seeing the uh, the government reacting to lower house prices by raising migration. Well, it's the it, it's the oldest trick in the book now, isn't it? It's just what they do. You know, you see housing prices get threatened, and then all of a sudden, you see near bipartisan support for policies to prop them up. I mean. You know, we've even seen that here recently in Australia with uh, the New South Wales Premier, who's, who was a Liberal, refusing to condemn Anthony Albanese's shared equity plan. Yeah. Shocker, you know, <laughs> because at the end of the day, it will help support housing prices because it will help support demand at a time when demand is going to get is going to get hit fa fairly hard, both by deteriorating confidence, which we'll get to in a couple of slides, and and also just the the fact that 
interest rates are rising, you know, and that's and that's really, you know, sort of putting the cat amongst the pigeons in terms of buying intentions. Yeah, and it's interesting because I published a, an article yesterday um, on YouTube regarding specifically the uh, New Zealand data, and I had quite a few comments from people saying, hey, actually, on the ground, it's even worse than the uh, the indices are actually reporting at the moment. But the other interesting observation is that the volume of listings has gone significantly up, the volume of sales has gone significantly down, and the number going by auction has dropped as well. So you can see all of those elements you know, working together, and it's pulling the markets down. And, um, you know, people are now saying, well, of course, they're going to lift rates again. So, you know, this is going to get to even more serious. So it's a really good bellwether for what could happen here, I think. No, I concur. And if anyone would like to have a look at the various data points, I'm, I'm actually quite thankful for it. the Real Estate Institute of New Zealand has a website, which I'll get Martin to link in the description, that has all the monthly housing price reports, which includes things like uh, the, the number of properties being listed, the number of property, the num- the amount that sales have gone up or down in certain areas. So if you're particularly interested in New Zealand, that might be something worth exploring for you. Yeah, I use that when I, when I make my shows about it every month, because it's a brilliant um, resource once you sort of worked out how it works and in fact they've got two reports one is actually the um, house price index data and the other is actually the overall market report so put them side by side and you can get a very good view of what's going on <laughs> it's not pretty no no it's not and it's, it's an excellent data source i wish we had something that just put it all together like that for australia it'd make, <laughs> it'd make, it'd make both head jobs a lot easier oh yeah and that's an idea oh, no we don't we have lots of people doing rather bipartisan uh, property reports instead no, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, on to confidence. On the left here, we've got ANZ's con- con- Consumer Confidence Index. And as you can see, it is at its, with excluding the impact of COVID in 2020, it's at its lowest level in basically a decade. It's getting hit hard. And it's, you know, a lot of people are quite, sang- are quite you know, quite, I wouldn't, I'm not, wouldn't call them pessimistic, but just a I don't know. Just, just not, not too, not too hopeful about about the immediate about the immediate future. And I can, it's, it's, it's easy to understand why. And on the right there, we've got the Westpac's Time to Buy Dwelling Index, and it's not going fantastically. It is at its lowest level since the financial crisis because a we've seen prices rise, and that that tends to drop the index quite significantly when prices rise quite swiftly. And secondly, now rates are rising, so. I wouldn't be surprised to see that fall even further, particularly if the RBA is as aggressive as the market is pricing them in today. Mm, yeah, and interestingly, the um, uh, uh, comparison of the drop from top to bottom in the last is quite similar to the drop directly after the global financial crisis. I mean, that's a really big shift. Yeah, and and last time during the GFC, it was it was Rudd, it was Rudd's um, first home buy grants that came to the rescue. Yep. it completely fired. It can fi- it fired up demand, and the number of people transacting just went through the went through the roof practically overnight. So, except this time, there's there's no help coming. At least the way the way things stand today. But you know, you can never rule it out with this government. You know, we do have the property prime minister at least for another week and a bit. Well, I've got this theory that after the election, whoever gets back in the migration tax will be opened and opened wide because that's basically the only lever they've got. And uh, I'm still waiting for the term funding facility version two to be able to throw deep, cheap money at the banks to try and get them to lend more. But, you know, who who knows? (laughs) But certainly I see it in my data too. The confidence has really dropped through the floor. And what I find so fascinating is that uh, it's quite broadly spread. So it isn't just one sector of the community now that is actually feeling it. It's actually first-time buyers and older home buyers, those in the rental sector. Uh, wherever you look, you see the same downtrend, and I think that's quite significant. No, I agree. And I've actually got some interesting breakdowns on the next slide. Now, this this is one that I've always found fascinating. It's consumer sentiment voting break, broken down by voting intention. And it basically shows how consumer sentiment flips on ele- when, when, when it comes to an election. If you look back, say, like in, in, 20, in, in late 2013 there, which is the, 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 blue, the first of the, the, blue, the vertical blue dotted lines, you can see how confidence for people who vote for the Liberal Party 
rocketed, while people who vote Labor, it fell off a cliff. So I think it's really interesting how bifurcated over time these things have become by, via you know polit political allegiance. Yeah, that is fascinating. And um, I, I, again, I you know I see some differences um, along similar lines, but it looks to me more confused this time. I don't know whether it's um, coming through in that uh, consumer sentiment uh, voting intention trend, but it, you know it doesn't seem to me necessarily as clear cut this time. It almost it, it feels as though everyone's sort of thrown in the confidence towel and said, "Oh, we don't know what's going on. There's too many things. We're just not very confident at all." Yeah, it it, it, it certainly does look that way. I mean, that's that's a an interesting, you know, the, the the example on the left is an interesting one for that reason because it basically shows the spread between consumer confidence and business confidence. And we've, we're at this weird junction now whereby business confidence is a lot, lot higher than consumer confidence. In fact, it's, it's higher than, it, than it's been, the spread between the two is larger than it's been in decades. So, for, so businesses are very confident about the future, but consumers aren't. So one has to imagine that in time, those, those two confidence figures are going to meet. And one would imagine that with rising rates and all the various headwinds provided by inflation, et cetera, that it, it, it may be business confidence that has to give and not consumers. Well, certainly it seems to me that there are some consumers still with quite big buffers and, uh, you know, they still feel relatively wealthy. But again, in my surveys, I'm seeing more people now saying, well, maybe I'll just hold off for a bit and see how this all shakes out. So if that is going to be true and in, if, in fact, consumers just hold off buying things, that's going to knock through to um, the business sector quite strongly. Indeed. And, we, and really, we don't know how much goods demand has been brought forward by the pandemic. You know, like so many people went out and, and bought, you know, home furnishings or, or, or bought, you know, new, new televisions, new, new desks, new, new monitors, whatever. All those things that you really only need to buy every so often. It's not really a consumable. It's you know requ that requires the immediate replacement. So I'm I'm really curious to see exactly how retail demand ends up faring once we sort of get through the last of the impact of the stimulus and we do start to see that same slowing economy that most of the rest of the world is experiencing at the moment. I mean, I I tend to think that based on our inflation data, we're just lagging the rest of the world. We're not having an entirely different experience. It's just the fact that we're behind and, and the fact that we've had additional tailwinds that the rest of the world hasn't had in 2021. Or oh, we've had more government stimulus. Well, that, that's the... <laughs> I mean, ours was bigger than pretty much any other country, yeah. right? Yes. Uh, yeah, exactly. And yeah. we also saw more in 2022 as well. So... Yeah. You know, we, we have seen that that cash flowing flowing through the economy, and we and uh, and the deficit is still enormous, and there's red ink as far as the eye can see. So, and I also just think, just on a tiny little tangential side note here, it's interesting that we're talking about the impact of wages growth on inflation, but we're not talking about the impact of the enormous budget deficit on inflation. Yeah, funny that. Which is actually a very significant thing, and of course the two hundred and fifty dollar payments, you know, flowing out at the moment, um, and the um, reduction of um, excise tax on on the fuel, temporary, right? And they're going to go away. Yeah, exactly, exactly right. And you know, there there is not really a lot of long term relief from inflationary pressures, and you know, we've all, I mean, you know, at least on paper, obviously, you know, your mileage may vary; it could be wetter for you, it could be worse, but you know collectively on based on aggregates and we both know how much we dislike aggregate numbers but here we go anyway <laughs> you know collectively we we've all we've all fallen behind yeah. you know we, we've fallen behind inflation in a big big way over the last couple of years and that's only going to get worse if the rba's target of you know, target the rba's prediction of you know six percent inflation later in the year comes true particularly if it gets even worse than that which you know the rba's forecasting track track, track record isn't exactly fantastic in that regard no, I don't know whether you've got one on um, on income growth, but the Centre of Work put out a really interesting chart that showed that in real terms, um, we're not going to see any growth in, in real income, according to the latest um, projections from the RBA, until 2024. Yeah, and then and then we're going to probably spend the best part of the next 10 or 15 years clawing, clawing that back because, yep. you know, I, I did the math the other day on 
for, for an article that will probably be coming out next week. And basically, in the last five years prior to the prior to COVID, total real wages growth was about one point nine percent. It was not. It was not fantastic, you know. And and then, now we've got to dig our way hot, out of a hole whereby in, inflation is rocketing ahead of wages growth. And you know, I mean, it, it could take it could take a decade. It could take longer to, for us to dig us out of that hole, particularly if there's no vision to actually fix the problems and the issues that we face. I mean, look, if someone gets into government who, who, who knows what they're doing and decides that, <laughs> oh, hey, maybe putting all, all of this emphasis on housing and all this emphasis on relying on mining and not actually, you know, doing something more productive with the economy, you know, in addition to those things, you know, we, it'd be a different story. But I haven't really seen that this election campaign. Well, the question is, um, will a bulldozer actually help? <laughs> Well, you know what? It actually would if they if they took a bulldozer to the to the unproductive parts of the economy and then just yeah. rebuilt what we need to. But you know, fat chance of that happening. <laughs> nice idea. <laughs> <laughs> this this chart is one is one of one of my favourites that I've seen so far this year because it basically just shows stagflation in a single chart. Manufacturing output is dropping. Is is. It's actually since since this chart was released, some global manufacturing output um, PMIs are showing contraction. So the amount of, that the world is producing is shrinking. Yet input costs are still are, are still continuing to rise and and are sitting at high, highly inflationary levels globally, more so in some other sectors and some other nations. And it just goes to show that we we are in the midst of of a stagflationary world now. You know, people can say, oh, but GDP is doing this and this, you know, all, all, all this indicator is doing that or unemployment's doing this. The reality is households, are, are, as we just literally just discussed that just then for Australia, households are falling behind the cost of living and inflation rapidly. Now, things might hold up okay for a time, but over the long term, that is going to weigh on consumption. It's going to weigh on confidence. And none of those are good things. No, and of course, it's uh, worth reflecting on what proportion of total GDP is reliant on households. Right in the US, it's extreme. It's pretty extreme in Australia. Um, and if, in fact, households continue to uh, fall behind and if their confidence levels continue to um, go lower, that's going to be a real drag. Yeah, e exactly. I mean, confidence levels in the US are already at you know, basically recession levels you know it's according to the university of michigan consumer sentiment survey if we go lower again you know on a recession on continued cost of living pressures you know political turmoil you name it it's going to get really really ugly you know it, from a confidence perspective which is you know as you say is going to eventually start to really drag on the economy in a big big way Absolutely. Well, it shows you the stupidity of GDP, but we won't go down that rabbit hole today, huh? No, no, we, we have before and I'm sure we will again, but, you know. Okay, now, this, this one actually, it actually kind of annoys me a little bit because we live in, the, we seemingly live in this world where there's all these things going on, you know, around the world, whether it's the war in Ukraine, lockdowns in China, et cetera, where things are going to be completely frank, quite poorly. And these things are going to have knock-on effects into the global economy for months and potentially years to come, yet they're ignored because her der, the Fed's raising rates or whatever other narrative that, that people cling to at the time. You know, but to cut a long story short, currently the large shipping lines, container shipping lines are cutting Oh, sorry, I should say cancelling somewhere between 33% and 39% of their sailings out of Asia. Now, people can say, oh, inflation's peaking, infl inflation's peaking until the, until the cows come home. But this is going to bite us in the ass unless demand absolutely falls off a cliff. It really is that simple. <laughs> yeah, and the fact of the matter is um, that reduction in traffic has a really significant input, in, in, impact on stuff coming out of China. But of course, it also means that traffic going back through to China also is going down as well, because by definition, the return journeys are actually lower too. Well, exactly. I mean, I heard from, I heard from a follower in shipping and logistics today who said, to, who, who said to me they got a letter from a freight forwarder saying that one in five 
container ships globally is currently stuck in traffic jams at major ports because of yeah. the, the logistics issues that, that lockdowns and port closures and everything else creates. Mm. So that's effectively one fifth of the entire global container ship fleet not doing its job, just sitting there idle. Meanwhile, you've got you know these these uh, these sailings being cancelled. All of which, all these things are adding to more supply chain issues, and people like people. Some people just don't don't see it. You know, they're like, oh, but Shanghai's been in lockdown for for what is it now? Six weeks, six weeks, um, yeah, roughly six weeks now. Yep. And they're like, how come we haven't? You know, that nothing's happened. It's like, yes, because the lead in time between the factory gate in China and the distribution center in the United States is about four months. Yep. So we're not going to feel it yet. We're going to feel it in a, in about. 10 weeks in about 10, 12 weeks time, we're going to start to feel it, you know? So all these things lay ahead, you know? And I, I think it's just, it's, it's so easy for people to go, oh, no, 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 that's, that's fine. The war in Ukraine isn't causing that thing. It's been going on for months now. It's not an issue. It's like, yes, it is, you know? <laughs> and that four months, by the way, is when everything's going well. Yes, yep. exactly. Right? exactly. In, in fact, that, we know that the lead times are actually even longer now. I was talking to someone the other day who... Um, is actually in the US, they are now planning nine months ahead rather than the normal four months to five months ahead because of the fact that it now takes a lot longer to get anything at all to be delivered. Yeah, exactly. And all of, and, and that's that's something that I covered in my recent uh, recent article a couple of weeks ago because the more the more companies have to inventory, the more they have to spend on warehousing, the more they have to spend on on holding stock. And that, that there's another inflationary factor right there. So, you know, all of these things have knock-on effects that, that just ripple through the economy over time. Yep. Yet, because they're not like these big, you know, punches, these big hits to the economy that we've come to expect since COVID started. You know, like they just they're, they're, they're overlooked. You know, yep. and I, I think that I think that that is really the sort of underlying message of what's going on at the moment. There is so much going on in the world that's just being overlooked in favour of you know these big headlines about the Fed or whatever else. Well, it reminds me of, I think it was um, a recent meeting, um, I think it was the IMF, but the, 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 the leader there said, you know, it's very difficult because we don't seem to be able to think, fix, uh, think on multiple dimensions at the same time. We, we focus on this thing or that thing, right? And in fact, the modern world is a very complex and very interrelated entity. And actually, there aren't that many people who seem to be able to get their head around all the moving parts at the same time. No, and the, the the concerning thing is is that the few people that do the people who work in who work in logistics who work in supply chains who who you know the, the, where this is their life they've been raising they've been raising the alarm now for two years. Yep. You know they've they've been saying that this is that these things are going to be a problem, but because they're not occurring with immediacy, they're dis, they're often too often disregarded. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. All right. This is the. Uh, <laughs> Global, global manufacturing output, that was, you know, as I said on the previous slide, this is a, I believe this is a more updated chart from JP, from um, JP Morgan and market. And basically it just shows that global manufacturing, you know, the, the amount of stuff actually being man manufactured is is falling globally. Yep, definitely um, recessionary looking to me, that chart. Indeed, indeed. I mean, and, and this is this is only the beginning. We haven't even had it. We haven't even had a recession or a proper slowdown in, in consumer spending yet. So, yeah. Yeah. okay, now this is about, I'm going to say about 10 days old at this point. And basically it just shows, because you can get data from the Chinese government, but then when you actually look at it, you've got data from the Chinese government. <laughs> so this is this is from a survey of Japanese companies with factories in Shanghai. And it shows that 63% of those companies have zero output at their factories and basically no work's being done. A further 28% have an output of less than 30% and others have output of at 70% or higher. And it just, it just goes to show that despite all the hopeful narratives, you know, when, like I remember a couple of, um, about maybe about a week ago now, it was like Tesla resumes production in Shanghai and there was this, you know, this, all these positive articles, you know, you saw, you know, CNBC going, you know, basically the worst is over, yada, blah, blah. And then a couple of days after that, Tesla stopped production <laughs> again because they didn't have the materials to make the cars. Yep. So, you know, I think that, I think that that's something that's, you know, still being overlooked. I mean, 
back in 20, the, back in the start of 2020, people panicked when, when China went into lockdown and went, oh, crap, we're not going to be able to get all the stuff. And now China's in lockdown again for an even longer time and people are just like, hmm. oh, biggie. And again, I was reading something the other day to say that, um, you know, some manufacturers are, for example, they're building most of the car, but they can't actually finish and deliver a car because they're waiting for certain chips that are now six to eight weeks late and they still don't know when they're going to get them. So the inventory of partly finished goods is just building up and building up and building up. And they're now trying to work out where to store them. Yeah, and that's another thing as well, just on the issue of semiconductors. I believe something over 50% of the world's neon, which is a key, a, a key component, a key uh, element in the production of uh, semiconductors and computer chips, is sourced from Ukraine. And things, you know, a lot of exports are not currently leaving Ukraine. And a lot of, and some of those factories are in, are in, are in areas occupied by the Russians. Yep. So that that's sure as hell not getting out. And, you know, all these things have just sort of been overlooked. And it's just like, you know, we just wait until they until they basically become a cataclysmic problem. And then we go, oh crap, I didn't, I didn't notice that. <laughs> and that, exactly. that just seemed it just seems to be the, the order of the day. But I mean, that's been the start, that's been like like COVID, like everyone's forgotten about Evergrande and the Chinese developers, but they're all still up the creek without a paddle. Yeah, another one defaulted this this week. So Yeah, yeah exactly. Third largest developer in, in, in China. And not only that, but all of them are gonna have to refinance their dollar dollar denominated debts at much higher bond rates. So good yes. luck with that. Correct. And of course the old good old exchange rates moving against them too. So what could be more, you know? <laughs> Yeah, no, that's not. I'm sure that's not going to complicate servicing at all. <laughs> Speaking of China, the steel margins for well, steel mills obviously are now negative, and in for for hot hot rolled steel, it is now the most negative it's been since at least the start of 2020. So you're starting to see the demand for for steel within within China start to start to drop off. So. This is not. This is really not good news for Australia because if we do, as particularly if, if we see rebar follow hot, hot rolled steel down, then you've got some fairly major problems because it, it just goes to show that this stimulus that everyone thinks is not everyone that a lot of people think are co- is coming for the Chinese economy in the form of more construction driven stimulus. If that doesn't turn up, we've got a problem because there's no way we can justify the current iron ore and coke and coal prices. No, and I think you put out um, commentary on Twitter the, earlier on saying if we're banking on China doing the same as they did post-global financial crisis, we might be kidding ourselves this time. Yeah, pr- pretty much. I mean, I that, and, and not only that, but the difference this time is that they've got hundreds of millions of people, hun- you, know, m- you know, tens of millions of businesses who've been impacted by COVID and lockdowns, yep. which... The Chinese government are committed to until at least the the, China, the the Communist Party Congress in October. So we're talking about another five months of this of some, of some variety hitting households, and I can only imagine how much that you know with, with the way that the Chinese conduct lockdowns. I can only imagine how much money they're going to have to spend on propping up those households and businesses, and they just might not have the resources there to be able to do that cut that type of stimulus. Not without risking, you know, systemic risk or either or or inflation, which is something that the Chinese government is absolutely terrified of. No, and just to uh, you know, draw draw the line there, that's going to have a flow and effect back into the property sector again, because it's going to reduce further the demand for new property, and uh, property sales are already dropping off a cliff, and you know they can't build them because they can't get the work. Oh, it's a mess. It is. It is. And and we've got a little bit about the Chinese property sector coming up. <laughs> Chinese housing prices on the left there. New yeah. homes in blue, existing homes in red. As you can see, existing homes are getting hammered. Yep. You know, it's... And uh, as you can also see there on the right, the, the Chinese love their wealth effect. They're all about, they're all about the property. You know, they're, you know it's, it's, their, it's their largest source of, of household wealth. And, you know, as you as you say, you know, with if the Chinese property sector does continue to roll over, you know, and they do, and they are forced to to park that that st- those stimulus funds elsewhere, 
you know, it's it, it could get it could get really quite quite challenging for for steel demand and for 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 those types of bulk commodities that are exclusively reliant on China as the main setter of prices. Mm. And just reflecting on the relationship between Australia and China, of course, we 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 chuck raw materials up to China, but we also import a lot of stuff from China, right? And what we're actually suggesting, I think, is that uh, both on the import side, um, you know, what we're leaving, what leaves Australia and what is exported um, may, may go down for those reasons. And the, on the other side, we said earlier that, well, we might not be getting the goods back anyway. So you can see how this disruption can impact both sides of, of our trade in Australia. So it's not just a, a thing over there, it's a thing down here as well. Well, exactly. They are the world's factory, and you yes. know, the longer the longer this goes on, the longer it's gonna it's gonna impact literally everyone else. And yeah. I mean, you know, a lot of people have speculated onto onto exactly why they're doing this, why they're basically taking a wrecking ball to their economy into the, you know, the the sort of positive fortunes of the the global economy. But the truth is, personally, I, I don't I don't know. I can only you know I can only speculate. But the re, the reality of this is is quite a quite a challenging one. Mm, well, if you think of that, they do play a long game, and uh, maybe they're looking over the horizon a bit to see how this could um, play out. Plus, of course, the the October critical event. Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, and that that does make walking back the the whole COVID zero thing all the more challenging. Mm. But it's 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 going to be interesting to watch because if we if we're still if we're sitting here in five months time and China has continued this policy. We're going to be looking at a, a bit. Let's just, let's just say a, a bit of a different world. I agree. U.S. thirty-year mortgage rates have doubled since January twenty twenty-one. It's now <laughs> they're now the highest since two thousand and nine. And I think we all remembered what happened last time U.S. mortgage rates were this high. There was a little thing called the Big Short, and then housing prices fell off a cliff. So it's going to be really interesting to see how the U.S. housing sector holds up this time, particularly because the rates were so low prior to this and the, the relative repayment size has risen so much and basically the, the purchasing power of a household has dropped so much now that, you know, there's, there's not really a lot on offer in some areas. So it's going to be really interesting to see how this unfolds in the, in the longer term. Well, two observations. Firstly, of course, they don't have the same adjustable rate problem that they had back around the global financial crisis. That's where people had really low rates and then they jumped up and so their repayments went up. And the other one is, of course, that um, US mortgages are long term. So people who've got those low rates will maintain those low rates. It's actually new loans that are being written at the much higher rate. And what that means is there's a very significant um, momentum loss then in terms of property sales. And we're already seeing in some places home prices in the US begin to go down because there's less interest and uh, people less able to, to, to buy. So it has a different dynamic to rate changes in Australia because if the rates doubled in Australia, that would immediately hit 75% of mortgage holders on the day it went up. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, exactly. It's, you know, their, their, their problem is actually relatively small in terms of the immediate issue because obviously, as you say, I mean, I believe about 90% of households who hold a mortgage have it fixed for somewhere between 15 and 30 years. Correct. Yep. So they aren't really exposed. But in terms of people coming into the market, wanting to buy another home, you know, to, to trade up, trade down, or people who are trying to get into the market, the, ha the house that they can afford, you know, the amount of money that they can afford to pay for a house has now dropped off in a big, big way in terms of the same monthly repayments. So it's going to be, it's, it's going to be really quite interesting to watch unfold because, you know, there are a lot of people out there smart people who've called it before talking about a US housing crash and yep. you know it's you know it may not unfold in the the swift fashion that the big short and the the 2008 2009 crash did but you know the fuel is arguably there well and just to remind everybody about the big short right so he held on for a long long time right and and prices didn't drop and things didn't fall off a cliff and then they finally did, right? And, and that's one an really important object lesson. Sometimes, you know, rates can move, but things don't necessarily immediately follow. You know, it can take a long time for it to work through and effectively. So m my own read is it's going to take some time for this to really come through and the consequences really show through in the economic numbers.
I agree. And so I think this is um, unlike in, say, Australia or Canada or New Zealand, where, you know, we, we, we do have the variable rate issue and, you know, we, we are more exposed and we do have higher levels of household debt. I don't think we are going to see that immediate hit. I think it's going to take a lot longer to feed through. But I will say something that is very interesting to me is if you look at if you look at the data coming out of places like Auckland in New Zealand or Wellington in New Zealand or Toronto in Canada, yep. prices are falling much, much faster than they did during the start of the, the US housing crash. You know, there was, you know, if you if you look at, say, for example, like you know, the case case Shiller housing price index. You know, around the time that that prices started to fall, not not after the, that we started to get the uh, we started you know the Lehman Brothers crisis and everything just completely fell to bits. But when that when housing prices started to crash, prices are falling much much faster. You know, yeah. I mean, prices in 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 Auckland fell by almost three percent in in the last month alone. I mean, if you extrapolate that onto Sydney, you know. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but if you just were to extrapolate that onto Sydney, you're talking about lo- losing forty-eight thousand dollars of the value in your home in a month, yeah. and that well, is just an, an insane number. And, and there is evidence, um, there's early evidence, but there's evidence that prices in Sydney are already sliding now. I mean, the the formal indices aren't actually reporting yet because they're probably six or eight weeks lagged. But some of the very early data I'm seeing suggests that people who are successfully transacting are having to accept um, a, a lower settlement. If you're a seller and you know purchases are coming into the level, and the other factor, of course, that's that's happened in all of this is that the net valuations that the banks are actually willing to accept from the valuers have already dropped. So in fact, um, they're not lending as much. So no. that's now a reinforcing factor. So the mortgage um, that you could get now, the borrowing power that you've got now, is lower than it was six weeks ago, and that means that you're going to see prices, particularly I think in Sydney and Melbourne, where of course they're extreme will come back faster. And yeah. uh, again, it'll be a bit of time before the data catches up. No, I, I agree. And I should and I should preface I should have prefaced that what, what I said by by saying that with the, the price falls that we're currently seeing in places like Auckland and Wellington, that the the rate rate started rising six or seven months ago. Yep. It took time for prices to start to fall and then for the, for sentiment to roll over. And then when now we're starting to see prices start beginning to beginning to accelerate downwards. Yep. So, you know, I think that, and, and not only that, but when it comes to Australia, it's just a case of who, who knows, you know, we've, we've, you know, we've got, we've got competing housing price indices. We've got vested interests. We've got all these different things. We've got, you know, potential government intervention. So in short, I'm not telling you to do, to do or do anything. <laughs> Make up your own mind and do your own, do, do your do own, your own research. Mind. But just bear in mind this. Politicians have, on average, statistically speaking, more properties than the average punter. Yes, exactly. Now, I, I, quite, I quite like this, this chart because it basically shows that even across the entirety of all demographics in the US, according to this survey, which I believe is from the Bank of America, 80% of households are using credit cards to keep up with the cost of inflation. And that is a truly mind-boggling number considering basically just how well off a lot of these households are. But the, just the fact that they'd rather just, rather than cutting back on spending, they're turning instead to credit, which is, which I think is, is really, really fascinating for a number of reasons. One, it means that there's going to be up continued support for consumer consumption there's going to be continued upward pressure on inflation in that regard because there's still though that that cash chasing goods which makes the feds problem which makes the feds life harder <laughs> but two eventually the pied piper has to be paid and you're talking about people who are losing purchasing power who are taking on debts which they're now going to have to service at a time that rates are rising so it's it's really it's really a quite an interesting one in that regard and of course, credit card interest rates are a lot higher than um, mortgage rates. So that's what people sometimes forget. But interestingly, um, Tarek, even here in Australia, again, my surveys are showing that some people who are struggling with the cash flow pressures, what they're reaching for are buy now, pay later, credit cards, and other personal loans, and including payday in that as well, to try and get through, right? Because most people who are under financial difficulty are assuming that this is a short term blip. They're assuming that things will begin to settle. Um, and so they're looking to sort of get through the next two or three months, right? What I'm worried about 
is that this is actually not something that's going to get fixed in the next two or three months. And so what they're doing is essentially just piling on more debt. They've already got big mortgages quite often as well, piling on more types of debt and essentially getting in further over their head. Um, the other factor to bear in mind is we're starting to see people pull more equity out if they've got equity in the property to try and cover some of the other debt. So the equity mates thing still running too. Those are not good strategic measures, in my view, given what we think is going to happen ahead. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned the whole equity mate thing, isn't it? Because on one hand, no, you can't have a pay rise that's slightly larger because that's going to be inflationary. But if you want to pull out a heap of money from your from your mortgage, pull out cash and then spend it within the economy to keep up with to keep up with the rising cost of living, to renovate your home, to buy a new car, whatever, that's a okay. I know. You know, I mean, you're talking about something that is 4.6% of GDP, you know. I mean, total household income in Australia is about, I believe, you know, this is this data is like probably four or five years old now because the ABS hasn't updated because of reasons. But, you know, total household income in Australia is about $970 billion a year. Now, if you look, if you look at that and then you extrapolate the fact that... 90 the 93 billion on top of that is solely coming from equity mate how inflationary is that you know relative to you know people getting a pay rise yeah. now I'm, I'm not saying that, that giving people five, a five percent pay rise wouldn't be inflationary of course you know naturally if, if you chuck that much extra cash into the economy at a time like this yes there will be additional inflation above what it would have been otherwise however if more people are pulling, pulling cash out of their mortgages and then chucking that into the economy, well, that's inflationary too. And perhaps there's, perhaps Scott Morrison and APRA and the RBA should get together and go, hmm, that is contributing to inflation as well. Maybe we should do something about that. <laughs> they won't because no. it, it, it was a bigger contribution than job um, JobKeeper. Yeah, exactly. It's not It's, not <laughs> it's just worth no, reflecting on that for a second. Happen. Hang on a moment. You've got a trillion dollars you know, on the, on the public record, as it were. But in addition to that, a whole lot of people pulled a whole lot of stuff out of their properties. And, of course, they also pulled stuff out of their super as well. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> and, and, and that's the... And exactly. And that's the thing. No one else had this level of support from, from, equi from home equity withdrawals. If you look at the US, even during, like, you know, let, let's, just, let's just take financial year 2020, 2021, for example, right? In the US, home equity withdrawals accounted for less than 1% of GDP over that time. In Australia, it was 4.65%. Yep. You know, you're talking about an economy that is running on home equity withdrawals that makes all these prior to COVID stimulus programs, but even like you say, it was bigger than JobKeeper. You know, it's an absolutely huge sum of money that nobody ever talks about. Exactly. Well, I mean, we do and a few, a couple of other people do, but it's, you know, it's mostly, at, you know, our end of the spectrum, social media, et cetera. You know, it's not, it's not really front page news, unfortunately. No, it's not. And, um, you know, it's increased the amount of debt in the system. Well, we, we, we know that it's um, the debt GDP number is, uh, is very high. But then just reflect on rising interest rates and the fact that many of those will be on variable rates. And then scratch your head thinking, well, why is it then that everyone's saying, well, they've got all these buffers? Well, some of those buffers probably are equity drawn out. You know, it, I mean, the whole thing goes round and round again. Ah, oh, the property market, don't you just love it? You know, it's, oh. it's, it's the Australian economy. Mm. I will actually have to say thank you to news.com because they have actually published quite a few of my articles right on the front page that have said, this is how much equity we are pulling out of our homes. Mm. So kudos to my editors on that one if they're watching this. Yeah, no, and very good articles too. I, you know, recommend you go read them, folks, if you've not read them. Tarek's done a great job of uh, really telling the story. And as, you, as he says, not many others are actually prepared to discuss it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm... I'm you know, I'm a, I'm a freelancer. I, I, I say what I want. <laughs> okay. This is basically the consequence of that chart that I showed you previously, that that, that basically consumer credit, and this includes credit cards, et cetera, that has just exploded in the US. You know, on an annualized basis, you're talking about well over $600 billion a year. And this is really just propping up the US consumer economy 
and not at, at the same time is as I said, it's putting pressure on on the Fed because if consumer spending holds up and the lagging indicators like unemployment hold up, they're going to have to keep raising rates. It's really that simple. <laughs> yeah, as day as day follows night and night follows day, it's a logical outcome, isn't it? It is. It is, and and that's that's really the the problem that the Fed now faces because everyone's like, oh, but inflation's peaked, oil's peaked, that's peaked. It, it doesn't matter. You know, if this if this stuff keeps going on behind the scenes, you keep seeing these huge expansions of credit. You keep seeing the economy getting propped up and those lagging indicators being supported. You know, stimulus, any kind of stimulus becomes the 2023 at the earliest type of type of thing. You know, as much as I, I as much as some Democrats heading into the midterms would just want to throw cash at things, they that option isn't really there at the moment. So no, no. They're it's getting, quite interesting in that regard. Yeah, they're getting more and more constrained in terms of uh, the wriggle room they've got, right? And that that's yeah. really the point. So, you know, if they turn on the taps, the quantitative easing taps, that's going to create problems. Um, the debt bomb is still ticking away nicely at the moment, of course. Um, and interestingly, I was looking at some data the other day, and that was suggesting that corporate um, corporates are having to think about borrowing much more at much higher rates just to keep their businesses running as well. So, you know, the corporate sector is also expanding credit too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. A risk Risks rising across the board in that regard. Yep, correct. Okay. <laughs> two two nice charts here. One on, on the left, we've got the average price of diesel in the US. On the right, average price of gasoline. As you can see, they're both, <laughs> they're both, at, all, they're all, both at all-time record highs. Now... I believe the one on the right is up to date as of today. On the one on the left, it, it's, it's actually gone even higher since then. Today is another record high for US diesel prices. Mm. And it just, this is one of the key things that I think is, is at times misunderstood. People go, but oil has peaked. People, consumers don't buy oil. They buy gasoline. They buy heating oil. They buy diesel. And those are still rising. And those are still rising strongly. So if we continue to see these trends supporting upward pressure on gasoline and on diesel prices, particularly heading into the US summer driving season, I think there's going to be some there's going to be some more issues with inflation. And this is going to continue to support inflationary pressures, whether inflation is peaked or not. Yeah, and the two observations. One is, of course, that's partly because it takes time. The oil has to get brought and, you know, they buy on a forward contract, but they have to then refine it. Right, so there's always a lag there, but the second is that there's some very interesting data suggesting that the um, uh, uh, petroleum companies are taking the opportunity to lift their margins, and so they've recently reported significantly higher profits. Right, and so in the UK, it sparked a conversation about, um, well, maybe we should have um, a windfall tax or something on the on the on the profits of, of the petrol companies because they're doing so well. Um, they're not actually in the business of keeping prices low. No, no, they're not exactly, and that's and that's going to be an, an inevitable part of of any, you know, of, of any large large run up in prices. And there's and on the other side of the coin, there's also the issues with self sanctioning in Europe with companies not get not buying r Russian refined products, Russian oil, and Russian diesel. You put all that together, and you've got ships shipping refined diesel to Europe from the US from the Arab world instead of them just buying Russian diesel. But the problem is, is that's then leading to lower stocks and in some cases, relative shortages in other parts, in, in, in other nations, which is then driving the price of diesel up in those places and in those regions. So, I mean, like say, for example, on the US East Coast, the, the inventory levels of diesel and heating oil are currently at their lowest level in, in decades. Yep. In, in, you know, in, in, in some instances, since comparable records began, you know, with, back in the late 1970s. So, you know, I mean, the, in, in fact, there was actually um, the CEO of Freightwaves said on Twitter a couple of days ago that truck stops on the East Coast, on, you know, in, in the eastern United States are, are having to, are, are seeing shortages of diesel fuel. And that's an absolute, that's an absolute disaster just waiting to happen. I mean, I assume that the politicians are going to get involved and they're going to fix the issue just as it becomes a catastrophe. But, you know, it just goes to show how these things butterfly out and, and, affect, th and affect so many things. Well, here's the question. Um, the time lag between um, petroleum 
coming to Australia and it being needed is, you know, a few weeks, right? We've got a, a, a small stock, but not a lot of stock here. We are very reliant on those global supply chains for petroleum uh, into Australia. And um, uh, some would say that we are ill-equipped to deal with those delays. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, I, I, a follower asked me to look into it a few a few weeks ago, and I and then Australia only produces less. Uh, I think it's a little over one fifth of the amount of diesel that we consume. We actually produce ourselves. Yep. So you know, I, it, we are incredibly exposed to rising costs in that regard, and that's going to flow through into everything from transport and logistics to. You know the co the cost at the at the supermarket counter because it's going to impact the cost of, of farming. And I believe the one fifth is subsidised by the government. No, oh, well, exactly, exactly. <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, we spend we spend tens of billions of dollars on submarines to protect our trade. You know, that our supplies of, of of key essential things like like diesel, like petrol that are both that are shipped here mostly from Asia. Yet. We could spend a tiny, tiny fraction of that and just have the capability to refine it ourselves and build up a large reserve, a, 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 you know, strategic petroleum reserve. But, you know, I mean, you know, where's, well, we, the, we, we where's, the, where's the political advantage in that? Didn't we buy petroleum and we're keeping it in the US? I yeah, well, I mean, that. you know, but that's exactly where you want something in a crisis, isn't it? You know, Australia gets blockaded or something and mm. there's like this big, you know, giant, military kerfuffle and then all of a sudden you know, oh we need our oil or oh, where is it oh well it's in it's in you know what oklahoma you know? <laughs> yeah. conveniently located just around the corner <laughs> yeah exactly you know you could get it in, in, in mere days <laughs> okay now this is the last chart for the day and basically it just shows us in, in us services inflation year on year excluding the impact of energy and I mean, it's, it really speaks for itself. You know, this is not about supply chains anymore. As much as people want to keep, bleep, you know, going on about it, it's supply chains, it's supply chains, it's not. Yes, supply chains are a massively contributing factor to overall headline numbers, but it's no longer solely about supply chains. And it hasn't been, to be completely honest, for quite some time. Yeah, yeah. And this underscores the critical thing that people don't understand, right? That inflation is embedded and it's much more broadly based. It's not just supply chain. Supply chain is a very convenient alibi, as is the Russia-Ukraine thing. But actually, it's much, much more complicated than that. And the services sector is now really right at the forefront. And that means it's going to get sticky and going on for longer. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly. I mean, it's just it's, it, the, the writing is on the wall. You know, the writing is on the wall for so, so, so many things right now. And, you know, some people are starting to read it because the market is getting whacked, yep. you know. But, you know, the, the, the reality is, is that the, the challenges of all this still still very much lay ahead. You know, I mean, whether, you know, you know if, if inflation is still a major issue towards the end of the year and into next year, we're still going to be talking about these same problems. You know, okay, they may have, you know, come down a bit and, and, you know, we might be talking about 4% inflation or 5% inflation or the high threes, but it's still a problem, it, particularly if, if wages continue, particularly if wages can't come, wages growth comes down and you, you're continuing to see consumers see their relative purchasing power being cut. No, I agree. And, of course, before the US inflation number came out, a lot of the market participants were saying, okay, well, it's going to be a lot lower. You know, this is the turning point. This is going to actually um, provide a significant boost to the markets. You know, it's back to normal. You know, supply chains are healing themselves, right? Well, everything that we've discussed today underscores that this is a long-term structural and strategic issue that we're dealing with. And it might come back a bit, but it's still way above the, you know, the central bank targets. This is going to grind on for a long, long time. Recession? Well, maybe. I mean, you know, some of the conditions look to me to be falling into place to, uh, for a considerable downturn. And then it becomes a question as to, so how far will central banks cope with recession and, and slow down to try and get inflation under control? Or will they have to flip and try and worry about not letting the economy tank completely? Um, central banks, they've got this amazingly created problem. They're now caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. Yeah, they, indeed. And I, I, that's actually something that, that I think that, that I was actually going to ask you just in terms of like, how, how, do you, how do you think that 
So, for example, with the US, the Yellen, it, it, there, I, I've heard rumours that, that Yellen and the Treasury and the Biden administration want a higher dollar. So they want higher yields because it basically just, you know, helps to suck in capital into the into the US. And part of me wonders if, if market, as long as markets stayed orderly in the US, and when I say markets, I mean the treasury market and the, and the bond market more broadly. Yeah. Do you think that they could just sit back and basically do not do do very little? I mean, obviously they'll do things like like swap lines and stuff to, to to other central banks and try to prop things up behind the scenes. But do you think it's possible that as long as basically cash keeps flowing into the treasury market, you know, as people panic, they go, "Oh, we've got to buy treasuries, got to buy treasuries." You know, do you think that they could basically just sit back and and and, and do nothing during that period, just as as long as it didn't impact the bond market too much? Well, I've had this view for some time that the strong dollar is a very important indicator of them hoping that they can just let essentially the markets be the markets. And so focus on getting the inflation thing sorted out, lift rates further. If they do lift rates, that will help the dollar further potentially as well. Um, and you know, there are enough people, and I'm thinking of people no longer thinking about investing in China, for example, and uh, you know some of the European countries, Suddenly, the US looks quite a strong place to want to go and, and play. Strong dollar makes a lot of sense. Um, there is going to be a point at which the markets, you know, the, the, they, I think they could well drop 30% from, from, from their tops. Um, and, and I don't think necessarily they would do much. But if they went 40%, you know, is that a turning point? Is there a point at which the, uh, the Fed would have to, um, you know, reorder its um, priorities? But I come back to this political cycle right so you know november is important in terms of the um the the, ne- the midterms biden wants to be showing that he's doing everything he can vis-a-vis inflation and inflation is his top priority powell is saying inflation is their top priority that means that they're going to ignore some of the other signals and use the strong dollar and just lift rates and lift them hard and fast in my view and then see what the collateral damage actually is and um it's worth bearing in mind, of course, that um, rates will go up in other countries too. So differentially, it might not actually do the US that much damage relative to other countries. It might actually be to their advantage with a very strong dollar. And I do think the strong dollar is actually the hook about which, you know, not many people are talking, but that's actually the hook that's hanging everything else off. Yeah, no, I, that's, that, that's, that's a sort of similar theory to one... You know, I've seen I've seen you know some some rather you know in, intelligent analysts you know put put forward and you know I've I've been hearing about for a while and I just I just think it's going to be it's going to be interesting just to see how all that just balances out because I mean like an interesting example was the the US Q1 GDP figures now it went negative because the US was importing you know so much more than it, than it exported prior because basically the global economy is slowing outside the outside more so. Yep. outside the United States in terms of that the demand for their goods relative to the demand for consumer goods within the United States. So I think that's really interesting just how well they're faring in relative terms because, I mean, Europe is going to be a basket case. That right. much is basically clear. You know, you've, they've got the issues with, with, the, with the sanctions, with the war in Ukraine, et cetera, and that's all going to... I mean, even the, even the Bank of England is talking about a recession next year. You know, I mean, and I believe they're the first, they're the first ones to begin to explore that. So I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be a, a fascinating thing to watch because I'm, I'm not, I mean, you know, like you were saying, you know, talk about like 40% down in the S&P. I mean, the NASDAQ is already nearly, I'm nearly down about, is it down about 30%, I believe, yeah, almost 30%. N- nearly 30, yeah. yeah. Yeah, nearly 30%. Def- definitely you know, into Bayer territory, yeah. Yeah, the, the, meanwhile, the S&P 500 is at its lowest that I've, that, that I've seen, you know, up to the time of this recording, you know, that's nearly in bear market territory. The Russell, the Russell 2000, which is basically, you know, smaller US companies that are concentrated their businesses mostly in the US, yep. that that's been smashed. So I, I really, I really do wonder if if the, there's the possibility of a whole lot more downside where they, I mean, we've we've seen 20% down and they're not batting an eyelid. They're just saying more, 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 more hikes and. Yep. It, it really makes me wonder what is it going to take for that to for that to stop because the dips keep getting bought. There's still dry powder of, of 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 people getting into the market and you know maintaining you know a relatively orderly orderly falls. 
So, you know, this isn't this isn't like, you know, March last year where the wheels fell off. You know, everything is still functioning the way it's meant to. So I do I do wonder if they, you know, they keep pursuing this this stronger dollar and they keep they keep pursuing, you know, this strategy that I mean, realistically, I I don't I'm not I'm not really in in, in some ways as, as desire leaving aside how desirable it is. I'm not sure how they stop. <laughs> well, do they want to stop? Firstly? Yeah, but, but I mean, even if they yeah. did want to, even yeah. if they suddenly decided yeah. that, you know, we need to support the market. Well, yeah. cool. How? You yeah. Know? Well, I mean, I suppose you'd reverse the quantitative tightening and start quantitative easing and drop rates again, but then the inflation would follow, you know, exactly. night, night follow day, which is why I say they've got this really narrow line. And, you know, somebody said to me the other day, gee, they're really walking a tightrope now. You know, it's it's not a highway, right? It's not a motorway. It's really a very narrow line. Um, and if you do believe, as I do, that um, they're happy to let the markets come back, and uh, in fact, if you look at the detail there, you know, not everything's dropped the same amount. So a lot of the high tech stocks have dropped dramatically, um, but some of the others haven't. And uh, you know, there are still sectors looking a little bit more positive relative to the, the overall drops. And I actually think the, the closest parallel is, is the two thousand tech wreck, right? Where effectively some particular segments went really dramatically off but actually others muddled through. And if that's what's going to happen, they can, they can afford to keep this going and continue to put rates up. Um, and like I say, for me, the real interesting comparison is what's happening in the US versus other countries, particularly other Western countries, right? Because the collateral damage, I don't think, will be in the US markets. The collateral damage will be in places like New Zealand and the UK and even Australia. And um, what I'm you know, hypothesising is that... Uh, those other central banks will find it difficult to follow suit the way the same way that the Fed is talking about doing, simply because their economic parameters are rather different. Yeah, no, I I, I concur. They don't they don't have the. I mean, frankly, even if you just even if you just boil it down to to house to households, mm. right? We have variable rates. New Zealand has variable rates. The, the UK has variable rates. Admittedly, um, they do have some some more a larger proportion of fixed term loans, but still, and on a longer term time horizon, they're just as exposed as the rest of us. Yep. The US households, I mean, something like seventy percent of US household debt is not exposed to rising rates. Correct. So it's not going to impact them. Yep. It's going to impact us. It's going to hit us a lot harder. They can afford to take rates to four percent. They can afford to break stuff, you know. And I think there's. There's two little two little takeaways there for me. The the first one is that we 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 are we are vastly vastly different to 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 the to the US. We are more exposed, and we can get hit a whole lot harder, you know. And and things here will break a whole lot sooner than that than they than they will than they will break there in terms purely on, in terms of rising rates impacting households. And I think another interesting one, just in terms that you're talking about in terms of indicators. The big one for me is oil because that's holding up at the moment. Now, normally when you see like a big risk off move, oil gets hit. It gets hit along with all the other commodities. You've seen copper come off recently, you know, and copper is quite a, a there's quite a strong correlation between copper and economic activity. Yet oil is holding up. Now, we, we, we obviously know that that is because of the war in Ukraine. We, we also know that that's because you know, of, of various factors, imbalances between supply and demand, OPEC, et cetera. But if oil does continue to hold up, that means inflation, in, and it continues not only that, but once the strategic petroleum reserve releases that the US is doing, that passes, and China does begin to reopen at some point, that means more demand for oil and potentially more upward pressure on oil prices. So, you know, oil needs to break for this to be a proper crisis risk off move in markets but we haven't seen that yet and if it doesn't happen that's going to be really really interesting yeah well there are people saying that um, this time it's a commodities um driven story right and oil being the, the, the critical one but you know like wheat and other things too and and that changes the, the the tenor of the whole game because basically those that are on the right side of the commodities uh, footprint will be able to manage it quite well those who aren't won't and I agree with you that um, with oil potentially going higher, and I think it probably will go higher, um, the, the, the fallout across all economies because of the fact that oil is you know, underpinning most activity 
is pretty huge. But again, I think the US is better protected than, than, than many because of the strong the strong dollar and what have you. So it's going to be very interesting. Um, it's really uncertain times. And of course, into the middle of that, the election, um, you know, ahead and um, whoever gets elected, I think they'll have a poison pill, frankly. I think they've got, <laughs> got a real headache coming. Well, they do. They do. I mean, you know, if if the market pricing is in any way correct so in talking about, you know, 2.7, 2.8% cash rate by the by year end, you're talking about, you know, potentially multiple 50 basis point hikes. Yep. And, and I mean, we've already seen that a lot of people have been quite unhappy with, with Scott Morrison about a, a quarter of a percent. And, you know, if you're talking about another, I mean, what were we talking about, say 2.3, 2.4% worth of rate hikes in the next what is it now? Seven months. Yep. Oh, that's going to piss a lot of people off, and it's going to be you know it's going to be like you say it's going to be a bit of a bit of a poison chalice in that regard, yeah. unless of course Labor can come up with a masterful narrative of, well, it's it's bad, but we can, we'll we'll at least do a better job than the other guy. It's a bit like Paul Keating did back in back in '93. You know, even though he you know he took Australia you know well not took, he led Australia through the recession we had to have, <laughs> and then. You know, he still managed to win an election after that. Well, we'll see. Very interesting times. Tarek, I appreciate your work on the slides and the, your conversation. Always great catching up with you. And we should, let's do it again soon. I'm sure there'll be more talk about. <laughs> well, we said that. We said that last time and then everything blew up. I'm, I'm, I'm getting the feeling maybe we should stop saying it. Like, <laughs> you know, we're jinxing the entire planet. We have that power. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, turn your charisma down the notch and see whether you keep it under control. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Mate. So, yeah, take care. See you later, mate. Bye. Bye.